那在下就失礼了。呀！呀！啊！我的妈！呀！哼，什么铁臂神拳？Welcome to Bubble Diorama, episode 177, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. This is the podcast that's all about the history and legacy of movies you know and movies you don't. And as always, hi, hello, welcome to Verbal Diorama, whether you are a regular returning listener, whether you're a brand new listener to this podcast, welcome slash welcome back. Thank you for being here. Thank you for choosing this podcast. No matter how you found this podcast, I'm so happy to have you here because this is a really special episode, actually. This is one of very few patron picks. Now, try saying that without spitting all over your microphone. Patron picks. <laughs> and we're going to be talking about the history and legacy of Crouching Tiger Hit Dragon. But before I go into that, I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who's listened to the most recent previous episodes of this podcast for a huge response to the episode on Terminator 2 Judgment Day. That episode was so wildly popular and also added so many values as well. Both of those episodes I chose to cover for something that I call Sequel Temper, which is basically sequels to existing episodes of the podcast. And those were both really well received by listeners. So just a huge thank you for listening. Thank you if you rated and reviewed or commented on those episodes. I got some really lovely comments for Terminator 2 Judgment Day. People who were really surprised at the level of detail in that episode. And if you are a new listener, you should not be surprised at the level of detail that I try to go into on episodes. I try to tell you as much information as I possibly can. I try to make it as interesting as possible. And basically, it is the history and legacy of the film in question. So there is always a great deal of detail in episodes of Verbal Diorama. But even I was surprised about Terminator 2 Judgment Day because there was still so much stuff that I actually didn't have time to go into. So please check out Makings of, of Terminator 2 Judgment Day if you do want more information on that. I've also got a link in the show notes for Terminator 2 Judgment Day for uh, an article for the visual effects in that movie on a site called beforesandafters.com. So please have a read of that. It's really, really interesting. Well, I find it interesting because this is the sort of stuff that I find interesting. And as I mentioned, I chose to do Terminator 2 Judgment Day and Adam's Family Values. This episode was not one that I chose, but I'm so glad that it has been chosen. And the reason why this is a patron pick is because higher tier patrons have a perk to choose episodes of the podcast. And as the literal highest tier patron that exists on the Verbal Diorama Patreon, Pete has that power and privilege. So many Ps. Pete, power, privilege, patron picks. But it's always been of a worry for me because I like to choose episodes that I know that I can find this information on how they made it. And I always wonder, am I going to be given a movie that I don't know, something random or obscure? Am I going to be given the Tom Cruise mummy? I mean, please, I beg of you, patrons, please don't make me do the Tom Cruise mummy in the future. Or am I going to get some terrifying horror movie that I'm just not going to want to watch? Not a huge fan of horror. I mean, I say that, but then listen to what's coming in October. <laughs> but in all honesty, my patrons, they are the finest patrons in all of podcasting. So this is a fact. And while this isn't the first patron pick for this podcast, that honour went to Sade, 
she chose the movie Clueless, which is another great choice, by the way. Pete has gone and picked Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which is a movie that I'd never seen before, but I'd always wanted to see. And boy, this movie does not disappoint. This is a terrific pick. Thank you for choosing this, Pete. And I hope this episode does one of your favourite movies justice. If you are a regular listener to this podcast, you will know how much I love martial arts and fight choreography. So this is a movie that really ticked all of my boxes. Not only in that regard, but in so many others, because this is a movie that feels so epic because it has action, it has beautiful scenery, but it also has comedy and love stories at its core. It's also very focused on female stories, which is something that I'm always really interested in too. So without further ado, let's just wire up, jump countless buildings in to the trade of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. In a land of eternal beauty and infinite mystery, a legend was born. The story of a warrior. The woman he loved. A daring outlaw. And a princess destined to become a warrior. Classics proudly presents Chao Yun Fat, Michelle Yeoh, Zhang Ziyi in an extraordinary romantic adventure. From Ang Lee, the director of Sense and Sensibility, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Nineteenth century China, in the waning years of the Qing Dynasty, the renowned swordsman Li Mu Bai decides to give up his legendary green destiny sword to mark the end of a bloodstained career. Li entrusts Yu Shuye with delivering the precious weapon to Governor Yu. However, once there, an audacious and nimble mad thief manages to steal it. As Xu Yan is hot on the trail of the skilled burglar, unrequited loves, fervent passions an unconquerable desire for freedom and bitter loose ends stand in the way. Let's run through the cast. We have Chow Yun Fat as Li Bubai, Michelle Yao as Yu Xu Lian, Zhang Ji as Yu Zhao Long, aka Jen, Chang Chen as Liao Xiao Hu, aka Dark Cloud, Lang Si Hung as Sir Tay, and Cheng Pei Pei as Jade Fox. Just a brief word that if I butcher any pronunciations of names in this episode, I humbly apologise. I'm terrible with pronunciations, but I am trying my best. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was written by Wang Hu Ling, James Seamus and Sai Kuo Jung. And it was directed by Ang Lee and based on Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon by Wang Du Lu. So in 1995, an adaptation of Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility came out to rave reviews and financial success. Based on Jane Austen's famous novel with a screenplay by quintessential English rose Emma Thompson, starring an all-star English cast of Thompson, Alan Rickman, Kate Winslet and Hugh Grant, it would earn seven Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture and Best Actress, with Thompson receiving a Best Adapted Screenplay Oscar for her work. Sense and Sensibility is still widely regarded to be one of the best Austen adaptations put to screen. It was also the first English language film and major Hollywood production for Taiwanese director Ang Lee, for whom English is not his first language. Tackling English 19th century period drama would be a challenge, but it was something Lee found an affinity with. 
His experience with social satire and family drama worked, and Sense and Sensibility became a huge hit, which put Lee directly onto a path of an interesting and diverse filmography. He followed Sense and Sensibility up with The Ice Storm, and then in 2000 with Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, based on the Chinese novel of the same name, serialised between 1941 and 1942 by Wang Dulu, is the fourth part of his Crane Iron Pentology. This starts with Crane Startles Kun Lun, Precious Sword, Golden Hairpin, Sword Force, Pearl Shine, then Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, finishing with Iron Knight, Silver Vase. Wang is considered one of the pioneers of the modern wuxia genre. Wuxia, which literally means martial heroes, is a genre of Chinese fiction concerning the adventures of martial artists in ancient China. A classic wuxia novel involves a young male protagonist who goes through some sort of catastrophe, such as losing loved ones, and then faces numerous trials and tribulations in order to learn various martial arts techniques from different combatants. By the end of the story, he's revealed to be an exceptional fighter. In some tales, the protagonist can be barred from joining a martial arts set, he endures hardship, trains covertly, and waits for a moment to impress those who previously despised him by showcasing his abilities. In subtales, a seasoned hero with formidable martial arts skills faces up against an equally formidable foe who serves his archenemy, gradually meandering to a final dramatic showdown between the protagonist and his nemesis. The earlier wuxia films date back to the 1920s. Early wuxia films produced in China include Red Heroine in 1929, Woman Warrior White Rose in 1929 and Woman Warrior of the Wild River Six Rumble at Deerhorn Gully in 1930. In 1925, the Shaw brothers, Runji, Runmi and Rundi, founded Tianyi Film Company in Shanghai. And in 1958, Shaw Brothers was established. It was the largest film production company in Hong Kong and the largest privately owned studios in the world at the time. With hundreds of actors engaged to exclusive contracts, the Shaw Brothers system was based after the traditional Hollywood structure. Shaw Brothers designated specific groups of performers to work solely with specific filmmakers, unlike other studios which cycled their cast members. Even Jackie Chan played bit parts in Shaw Brothers movies. Shaw Brothers was the studio to go to for wuxia films. Between 1965, when they launched the self-proclaimed new era of wuxia pian, and in 1985, when they stopped film production, Shaw's produced over 150 films that not only redefined the genre, but also changed the entire Hong Kong film industry. Shaw Brothers' Wuxia films featured sophisticated action choreography using wire and trampoline-assisted acrobatics combined with sped-up camera techniques. Now for this podcast, it's all about facts and research. And I am quite insistent that I try and make these episodes as accurate as possible. But oftentimes, I'll actually realise things through researching these episodes that I just didn't know. That actually happens probably 99% of the time. But one of the most interesting and important things I realised when researching Crouching Tiger, Hit the Dragon is that there is a difference between wuxia and kung fu films. It sounds pretty obvious in hindsight, actually. So let me explain the difference. Kung Fu is newer and focuses primarily on hand-to-hand combat and traditional fighting forms. And there's a general emphasis on the performer's physical skill. Special effects are generally frowned upon. Most famously, Kung Fu movies have been headlined by Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan, directed by famous Kung Fu directors like Lau Carl Jung. Wuxia films often incorporate fantasy elements. They use special effects to allow their heroes to fly, shoot concentrated chi energy out of their bodies, and in other ways violate the laws of physics. Jet Li, T Lung and Jimmy Wang Yu are the biggest wuxia stars, and King Hu, Chang Che and Su Hark are notable directors. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon is set during the Qing Dynasty, which was officially proclaimed and named the Great Qing Dynasty by Hong Taiji in 1636 in Manchuria, seizing control of Beijing in 1644, and later expanding its rule over 18 provinces of mainland China and Taiwan, expanding to Inner Asia, which includes parts of Western and Northeast China, as well as Southern Siberia. The Qing dynasty was multi-ethnic and lasted nearly three centuries and established the territorial foundation for modern China. It was the largest imperial dynasty in Chinese history, and in terms of territorial size, the fourth largest empire in world history in 1790, it was the world's most populous country in 1907, with 419.3 million citizens. 
The dynasty lasted until 1912, when the child emperor Pu Yi abdicated, resulting in the Qing dynasty's demise and the rise of the Republic of China. This effectively ended over 2,000 years of imperial China and nearly 268 years of Manchu rule in China. And while the novel is set during the Qing dynasty, no specific date is given. And rather than giving an accurate account of Chinese history, Li aimed to portray a, quote, China of the imagination. He wanted to create a movie that Western audiences would be interested in seeing. The movie was shot in order to achieve a balance between Eastern and Western aesthetics, and there are certain situations that display unusual craftsmanship for a martial arts movie, including things like an aerial clash amid delicate bamboo bushes, which I'm going to be coming to. I started this episode talking about sets and sensibility for a reason, because Ang Lee not only wanted to push himself, but also realise a childhood dream of directing a wuxia film. He wanted to make a movie with all the emotional resonance of sense and sensibility, but with the majesty and jaw-dropping action of wuxia. Without personal experience in the genre, which has a long history and well-established conventions in Chinese culture, he called in the experts, namely famed Hong Kong action choreographer Yuan Wu Ping, who just come off working on The Matrix, of all movies, but I'm going to come back in a little bit to the choreography and fight scenes. Also enlisted by Ang Lee were cinematographer Peter Powell, composer Tan Dun and cellist Yo-Yo Ma. Peter Powell was Lee's third choice for cinematographer after Gu Chang Wei or Christopher Doyle, but Powell was the only one out of the three who had action movie experience. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was always going to be a huge undertaking, no matter who took the project on. A sweeping historical epic with martial arts, romance, and the sort of imagery that is still remembered 20 years later. But it was also a notoriously troubled production and full of constant behind-the-scenes drama. Ang Lee set about finding his perfect cast, but it immediately led to problems. First of all, his top choice for the role of Jen was Xu Qi, who turned the movie down. Zhang Ji, aged just 19 and only her second role, was chosen instead. She was actually the only member of the cast who spoke in the required Mandarin dialect. Lead actors Chow Young Fat, originally from Hong Kong, is a native Cantonese speaker, and Michelle Yeoh from Malaysia spoke English and Malay. Chong Chen was Taiwanese. He did speak Mandarin, but with a distinct Taiwanese accent. This left Zhang, the only lead actor who spoke fluent Mandarin with a native Mandarin accent. The first day on set, Chow Young Fat had to do 28 takes because of the language issues. Michelle Yeoh, who had wanted to work for Ang Lee for 15 years, spent a year before filming training and learning Mandarin, but she also found the language barriers traumatic and of trying to speak her lines phonetically in Mandarin with the help of the crew. With the addition of a knee injury, she tore her anterior cruciate ligament during filming, which meant she would need surgery and a month's rehab in the US. This also meant some of her choreography had to be changed to accommodate her injury and the shooting schedule amended to aid her recovery. Zhang Zhi, unlike the other cast members, was not a trained martial artist. She instead used her dance training to practice the intricate fight and sword scenes, and despite not being trained, totally holds her own against Chow Yun Fat and Michelle Yeoh. And as I said, this was only her second film role. She'd most famously go on to star in Memoirs of a Geisha. The whole shoot was physically exhausting for everyone involved, but especially Ang Lee, who didn't take a single day off for eight months. A visionary and perfectionist, Lee insisted on shooting on location, as well as taking his own time to learn the limitations of stunt physics. Director of photography Peter Pao set off on a journey across China, seeing a variety of places, including the western desert parts of Xinjiang province, the Yellow Mountains of Adhul in the south, Chen Dei's summer castle in the north, and the bamboo grove near Anji. Extensive storyboards were drawn up featuring these exotic locations. The most well-known scene of the movie between Zhang Ji and Chao Yun Fat's characters atop 100-foot bamboo trees was filmed in the Onji bamboo forest and proved a logistical nightmare to set up a film. How do you get industrial cranes into a hilly forest setting? How do you have the cameras as high as possible to capture the action from the actors suspended on wires from the cranes? And how do you make those scenes feel weightless and beautiful and ethereal? The answer came from Peter Powell's second assistant, Louis Jong, who designed a rig that a PowerPod remote control head attached to to keep the camera remaining balanced throughout the tricky shoot. Each actor is being pulled through the trees by 20 to 30 people 
to imitate the swinging nature of bamboo. Pow also assumed the role of de facto visual effects supervisor for wire removals for the movie following filming because the production didn't have the budget for a dedicated visual effects supervisor. He remained uncredited for the role because director of photography is the larger credit. Asia Cine Digital in Hong Kong did all the wire removal on the movie, which came to about 300 shots. The bamboo sequence was the most difficult wire removal sequence since each individual had three to four wires and the bamboo leaves are so small and narrow. They had to paint the leaves extremely carefully. Additionally, they had to digitally colour time the entire scene to make it match because they were shooting over such a long period of time and at various times of the day. Since the cables were designed to look as natural as possible, Powell was unable to utilise some of the more conventional lighting techniques, such as using hard light to conceal them. Mannix, the visual effects studio in charge of the effects in The Matrix, completed about 50 extra visual effects shots. And while the vast majority of the film is shot in camera, there are some subtle effects that Mannix completed, including the recreation of Qing Dynasty China by using 115th scale miniature models of housing, recreated from reference photos of villages in China, and recreating the buildings, pasting them in digitally and adding matte paintings for backdrops, and digitally adding things like flying birds into the fray. Extensive pre-visualisation was done for the wirework scenes to plan for actor locations. Some shots though, such as when Jen and Mubai are flying over a pool, had to be shot twice. Once with each actor performing the wirework, as logistically they couldn't set up the shot with two cranes. So each actor was filmed and then Mannix used both shots to make it appear they were flying and defying gravity over the pool together. Stunts were mostly completed by the actors themselves and only stunt professionals briefly in wide shots. It was important to Ang Lee to have really good actors who could do the majority of their own stunts rather than stunt performers who could act. It was a compromise made between Li and Yuan Wu Ping, who designed the fights between dramatic effect and beautiful choreography and action. Usually, Yuan would have a core team of under 10 people on fight choreography on the films that he choreographed but for Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, he had 60 people because each of the wired up actors had to have a team of at least five people to operate the wires and ensure the actors moved in the right direction and to make sure the wire work looked as graceful and elegant as possible. Sword fight scenes were also carefully choreographed with the correct weapons being researched and authentic movements on how to use those weapons, such as when Michelle Yeoh and Zhang Ji's characters fight. Zhang with the Green Destiny and Yo with a traditional Chinese Dao and using traditional Chinese Dao movement, including an intricate head wrap as she protects herself when spinning with the broadsword. There's actually a fantastic video on YouTube hosted by weapons expert Laura Sun of Fire and Steel who analyzes the fights in Crouching Tiger, Hit Dragon. I'll pop a link in the show notes to that video. She basically explains about there only being around 23 weapons in Wuxia Kung Fu and highlights how well choreographed the fight scene is. Each weapon Michelle Yeoh uses from Dao to spear to the Shaolin twin hooks to the monk spade and also how well shot it is too. So look out in the show notes for a link to that video. And the sparks coming off the weapons, that's not CG. They are real sparks created by putting electrical gear and wires on each weapon so that when they connect, you get sparks. Ang Lee would recall that no such trick would ever be allowed on US-made films. The first phase of the five months of filming took place in the Gobi Desert, where incense was burned for good luck, but it almost constantly rained during the shoot. The rest of the film was shot in Beijing, with location shooting in the Anhol, Hebei, and the Anji Bambu Forest in Jiangsu, and the Xinjiang provinces of China, and on location at Mount Kangyun. Most of these locations were so remote, there was extensive travel times and many locations had to be hiked to because of the lack of roads. With themes of emotional suppression, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon is both an action movie and a romantic movie drama. Eugene faces an arranged marriage but secretly trains in martial arts and dreams of adventure against societal roles and expectations. The sins of the past are exposed and the toxicity of festering herd is explored as the antagonist Jade Fox killed Mubai's master because he had an affair with her but refused to teach her martial arts, and repressed desire in the fibbing love story of Li Mubai and Xu Mian as they harbour an unspoken love for one another but never act upon it. This is a unique example of a wuxia film that puts women front and centre and emphasises their passion, agency and ambition to succeed. 
That ties neatly into the name of the movie. The phrase Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon is a literal translation of a Chinese idiom as a place or situation full of unnoticed masters. The line is taken from a poem by the ancient Chinese poet Yu Jin that reads, Behind the rock in the dark probably hides a tiger and the coiling giant root resembles a crouching dragon. There are a number of other layers of meaning in the title, the story between Zhu and Dark Cloud, and that the last characters of their names, Xiao Zhu and Zhao Long, stand for tiger and dragon respectively, that's probably the most obvious, but also that no one expects the women to be the protagonists of the story, or indeed the antagonists, as well as the secrets women hide, whether it's a secret forbidden love or secret martial arts skills, or having to behave a certain way in polite society, such as Jen's expectation to undertake an arranged marriage. Basically, don't judge a book by its cover. And even women can be total badasses, which if you listen to this podcast, you should probably know by now. Anyway, Ang Lee knew the Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon would live or die on Western audience reaction to it, and he took extra special care to ensure the film was as appealing to English-speaking audiences as possible. He personally edited the English subtitle track to ensure the translation was as satisfactory as it could be. For the English language dub, extra care was taken to ensure that the voice actor's performances and wording matched the original lit movements almost exactly. And another man who takes extra special care to ensure that his films are as appealing to all audiences is Keanu Reeves. And it's time for the obligatory Keanu reference. And this is the part of the podcast where I try to the movie that I'm featuring to Keanu Reeves. And I think you know what's coming. Because I think I've made it quite obvious that Yuen Wu Ping was the fight choreographer on The Matrix. So the year before Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Yuen Wu Ping had worked with Keanu Reeves on the incredible martial arts scenes in The Matrix. It's really probably one of the easiest obligatory Keanu references I've ever done. And yes, it is obvious. But yes, I'm totally going to use it. Because why would I not? I'm going to talk about the awards this movie won in a little bit. But, spoiler alert, this movie won Best Original Score at the Oscars. And you would think that was an incredible achievement in itself, just generally. But composer Tan Dun achieved even more than that. Because he only had two weeks to finish writing and recording the whole score for this movie, which was originally performed by Shanghai Symphony Orchestra, Shanghai National Orchestra and Shanghai Percussion Ensemble. It also features many solo passages for cello, played by Yo-Yo Ma. The fact that he scored this movie in just two weeks, and then he went on to win Best Original Score. I mean, it's phenomenal work. A title track called A Love Before Time was performed by Coco Lee at the Academy Awards. That was nominated for Best Original Song, but unfortunately it did not win. Another thing that I did not know about this movie is there was a third-person beat-em-up video game with platforming elements that came out for the Game Boy Advance, PlayStation 2 and Xbox in late 2003 and early 2004. You could play as Li Mu Bai, Yu Shu Lian, Jen and Lo. It didn't get very good reviews though and the GameCube version was subsequently cancelled. So when it came to its release, Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon had an initial limited release in just 16 cinemas in the US. That was on the 8th of December 2000. And in its first week, it opened at 15th place in the box office. But it kept gaining traction based on word of mouth. And it gradually started appearing in more theatres across the country. In its third week, it jumped 243.6% up financially. It premiered wide on the 12th of January 2001, becoming 9th at the box office. The movie continued to sit in the top 10 for a further 12 weeks slowly gaining momentum, and it would end up remaining in the US box office charts for a total of 31 weeks. That's how popular this movie was at the time. This is also the highest grossing foreign language movie in American film history, grossing more than double domestically in the US than its nearest rivals. Movies like Life is Beautiful, Hero, which was greatly inspired by this movie, and Parasite as well. On its $17 million budget, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon would gross $128 million domestically in the US, $85 million internationally, for a total worldwide gross of $213.5 million. And critically, in the West, that's important, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was exceptionally well received by critics, 
currently sits at 97% on Rotten Tomatoes, and it would lead to other Wuxia films like aforementioned Hero and also House of Flying Daggers being marketed towards Western audiences. In China, though, the response was underwhelming, to say the least. While Hollywood critics praised its lavish visuals and mind-blowing martial arts, Chinese critics laughed it off as unrealistic, exaggerated and laughable. And they didn't like the fact that the actors seemingly struggled to speak Mandarin. And then there was the botched release in China. A private production company, Asian Union Film and Entertainment, and the China Film Co-Production Company, one of China's 16 statement film studios, split the rights to the movie's release in the country. Chinese government requires that all international films have a state entity engaged in the film's release. Asian Union contributed 80% of the $1 million cost of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and China Film contributed the remaining 20%. But once the film debuted at Cannes and caused a sensation, state officials wanted to freeze out Asian Union by buying out the private company's majority share, something which Asian Union refused. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was pulled from cinemas almost immediately after its Chinese premiere in Beijing, despite a huge publicity campaign. It was shelved for three months while China Film negotiated with Asian Union and made excuses as to why it couldn't be released. Eventually, China Film gave up on Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. It informed Asian Union that the movie may indeed be released, albeit on such short notice that the company would not have time to remarket the film. By that time, the streets were flooded with counterfeit DVD versions of the film that were being sold for as little as $2.50 each. Everyone who was interested in watching Chow Yun Fat and Michelle Yeoh demonstrate their fighting skills did so at home and expressed their disappointment to others, mimicking the Chinese critical thinking. So when it was finally released in Chinese cinemas, it substantially flopped, only bringing in 10 million yuan or $1.2 million. And while it didn't do so well critically in China, as I said, it did fantastically well when it came to Hollywood awards season. The film received 10 Academy Award nominations, which was the highest ever for a non-English language film, up until it was tied by Roma in 2018. It was nominated for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Adapted Screenplay, Best Costume Design, Best Film Editing and Best Original Song for In Love Before Time. It would go on to win Oscars for Best Foreign Language Film, Best Art Direction, Best Cinematography and Best Original Score. Its Best Foreign Language Film Oscar was presented to Taiwan, despite it being an international co-production between companies in four regions. The Chinese company, China Film Co-Production Corporation, the American companies, Columbia Pictures Film Production Asia, Sony Pictures Classics and Good Machine, the Hong Kong company, Edco Films, and the Taiwanese Zoom Hunt Productions, as well as Asia Union Film Entertainment, which was created solely for this film. At the BAFTAs, it was nominated for Best Film, Best Actress in a Leading Role for Michelle Yeoh, Best Actress in a Supporting Role for Zhang Ji, Best Cinematography, Best Makeup and Hair, Best Editing, Best Adapted Screenplay, Best Production Design, Best Sound and Best Visual Effects. It won BAFTAs for Best Film Not in the English Language, Best Costume Design, Best Director and Best Music. And I didn't even know there was a sequel to this movie. In fact, I didn't even know, technically, there are two sequels to this movie. So the first is a 2001 Taiwanese TV show of the same name, also based on Wang Dulu's novels, was released in the US in 2004 as New Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. And an official film sequel to Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was released in 2016, a co-production between Pegasus Media, China Film Group Corporation and the Weinstein Company. Brr, we don't like the Weinstein Company. This time it was shot in English and given a Mandarin dub for China. Michelle Yeoh and Donnie Yen featured in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Sword of Destiny. Ang Lee didn't come back to direct, so Zhang Xi didn't return either. Instead, it was directed by Yuan Wu Ping, the first movie's voice cinematographer. The movie was released on Netflix in the US and shall we say, it's not as critically acclaimed as its predecessor. Let's take this opportunity, though, to move over to some listener thoughts. So I like to ask on Patreon, on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and I like to find out what people think of the movies that I'm featuring. And we're going to start with the patrons. And we're going to start with perennial commenter Andy. And Andy says, 
It would only make sense that Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon would be one of the most influential films of the early aughts. A film steeped in beautiful set pieces, fantastic performances and some of the most balletic void choreography ever set to film. A marvel of cinematic achievements and well worth a rewatch. It is worth a rewatch, Andy. And if you haven't listened to Andy's podcast, Geek Salad, or you want to re-listen to Geek Salad, then I'll put some information in the show notes for his podcast. It is called Geek Salad. And it is basically a podcast that talks about all geeky, brilliant things. There is nothing they don't love to talk about over at Geek Salad. Movies, music, TV shows, games, literally everything. So I'll put some information in the show notes. Please check out Geek Salad. And I could not include a comment from Pete, who actually requested this movie in the first place. And Pete says, This movie is in my top five of all time. It holds up perfectly 22 years after release and is gorgeous to the eyes and ears. The first fight scene alone is more impressive than most action movies' entire runtime. And the rematch in the weapons room is jaw-dropping and awe-inspiring. Lee Mubai and Yu Shulian's relationship is beautiful and tragic. Gotta go. Time to watch Crouching Tiger again. And once again, Pete, thank you for choosing this movie. And Pete's podcast is called Middle Class Film Class. And he also gets a little plug for his podcast too. There is actually going to be at the end of this episode a tiny little ad for Middle Class Film Class because not only does Pete get to pick movies for me to cover on the podcast, but he also gets his ad on selected episodes as well. So if you don't believe me when you should listen to Middle Class Film Class, then if you listen at the end of this episode, you will hear him telling you to listen to Middle Class Film Class, so maybe you should just listen to Middle Class Film Class. And the final patron comment comes from Derek, who says, It's a stunning movie with unprecedented fighting scenes, which breaks ground in so many innovating ways. I can't wait to listen to your episode and learn how they made such a phenomenal movie. Well, there it is, Derek. (laughs) I hope you've enjoyed listening. I would love for you guys to do an episode of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Maybe it's something you could add to your list. I know you guys are incredibly busy. Basically, for everyone else listening, just having a conversation with Derek right now, he and his wife, Laurel, they host a podcast called The Midnight Myth. And they basically go into the history and mythology and philosophy surrounding popular stories in pop culture. And I would love for them to go more into details about this particular movie and about Chinese mythology. I would love that. So maybe, maybe you guys could consider it. But otherwise, uh, for everyone else listening, please have a listen to Derek and Laurel's podcast. As I said, it is called The Midnight Myth. And I'll pop some information in the show notes for their podcast. Moving over to Twitter. Only a couple of comments over on Twitter this time around. We're going to start with at DW Lundberg, who said, Ang Lee mixes pathos and shock, socky action and enthralls the world over. The martial arts sequences are breathtaking, but they'd be empty surface pleasures without the movie's themes of honour, betrayal, sacrifice and love. That's heady stuff for filmmaking of the highest order. And at Death Heaven, who said, It's certainly beautiful to look at and a lot of craftsmanship went into the production, but I'm not much of a fan of Wire Fu. I like my martial arts a lot more grounded, which is admittedly not easy to find these days. And a couple of extra comments over on Instagram from at Sean Geek Podcast, who said, A pure masterpiece. Every piece is perfectly placed. Not just a great movie, but a pure work of art. And at Paulie1701, who simply says, Love this movie. Not a lot of comments for Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon this week, but some really good comments for Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon this week. So I think this is a case of quality over quantity and I'm hugely grateful to the patrons I'm hugely grateful to Pete for picking the movie in the first place but to all of the patrons who commented and to everyone on Twitter and Instagram nothing on Facebook by the way huge thank you to you all for your comments on Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon 22 years later it's easy to forget what a cultural shift and groundbreaking success Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon actually was to have A Chinese language, Chinese set, Chinese cultured film not only received box office success as well as critical acclaim, but changed the way Western audiences viewed subtitled and foreign filmmaking. A 
Upon the release of his film Parasite, Bong Joon-ho remarked to the audience while accepting his Golden Globe in 2020, quote, Once you overcome the one-inch tall barrier of subtitles, you will be introduced to so many more amazing films, unquote. While Parasite was a huge critical and commercial success, it seems crazy that 20 years earlier, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon had already made those points vastly clear. Arguably without Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, we may not have had wide releases for movies like Parasite. It would be easy to just make a wuxia-style movie with English dialogue and mould it exclusively for English-speaking audiences, and it probably would have done okay. But for Ong Lee to try and keep this movie as authentically Chinese as possible, to include important themes such as expectation, social oppression, and honouring responsibilities, as well as including emotional beats and some of the best martial arts choreography, and putting just enough in there for Western audiences to react to. It seems like an impossible feat, and yet he did it. And Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon is one of those movies you could revisit again and again and get something new out of the experience. Like making Sense and Sensibility with martial arts, it's not attempting to mimic the wuxia films of King Hu or Tsu Hok, but to make something that infuses both wuxia tradition and Hollywood's love of action, comedy and romance. Of course, it probably helped the Western audiences knew Chow Yun-fat and Michelle Yeoh, Chow Yun-fat from The Replacement Killers and Anna and the King, and while both weren't huge box office hits, he was still reasonably well known. Michelle Yeoh had starred in Tomorrow Never Dies in 1997 alongside Pierce Brosnan's James Bond, and Wai Lin is still regarded as one of the best Bond girls of all time. She proved so popular that MGM considered developing a spin-off focused on her. And Michelle Yeoh is also in Everything Everywhere All at Once, which is phenomenal. If you've not seen that movie, please go and see it. It is one of the best movies that has come out this year, if not the best movie that's come out this year. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon was always on my list to watch one day. But I have to say a huge thank you once again to Pete for suggesting I cover this movie on the podcast so I could finally get off my backside, back on my backside, and watch Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Because I loved it. I now own it on DVD so I can watch it again and again. I probably should have bought it on Blu-ray, to be honest, because this is a movie that I think benefits high definition so much. But maybe one day... I'll do the right thing and I'll buy it in proper high death. It's also quite a poignant movie as well, because at the end, when Yu Zhen jumps from the Wudan Mountain, you realise that she's finally taking control of her own destiny. She's not submitting to an arranged marriage. She's not having training forced upon her or being with her possessive lover. She decides to be at peace with herself and with her own destiny. I've read a lot of think pieces that consider this a suicide, but I don't think it is. I think it's a peaceful transition to be at one with herself and her decision to be herself. This is a character that re-establishes her own agency after having an entire movie where she's had none by turning to a spiritual path. She's now free from the choices thrust upon her by others. This is her path to happiness and she serenely floats towards it. And I absolutely love the ending of this movie and Yes, it made me very emotional because I think given the choices that she's given, we'd all just want to choose the path of unburdened happiness and we would also like to kick as much ass as possible. Thank you for listening. As always, I'd love to hear your thoughts on Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. And if you've enjoyed this podcast and you want to get involved and you want your comments read out in future episodes, then all you have to do is on a Saturday, on social media, I put up thoughts posts for the next movie. All you need to do is comment on one of those posts, whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Follow me at Verbal Diorama and you will find them. And I will not only read out your comment, but I will credit you as well in both the episode and the show notes. And it's one of the easiest ways to get involved with this podcast. If you want to help this podcast grow and be noticed by more people, you could leave a rating or review wherever you found it. You could retweet or like posts that you see on social media, or you could simply tell your friends and family about this episode or about this podcast. And if you did like this episode on Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, you might also like one of the following episodes. So I try to give you an episode and a movie that has links to this one. And really, the only two that I could think of is episode 12. All the way back in 2019, I did an episode on Charlie's Angels. And this was obviously Hollywood's take on Wire Fu. 
And I'm a huge fan of the Charlie's Angels movie from 2000. These movies came out in the same year. And I'm a huge fan of Charlie's Angels. I find it so much fun and so campy and so silly. And it is my Charlie's Angels movie. But I love the ridiculous waifu in that movie. That is episode 12 of this podcast. And then in episode 14 of this podcast, I did an episode on The Matrix. Obviously, Yuen Wu Ping, the connection with Keanu. The Matrix, I don't need to tell you what The Matrix is. You just have to discover it for yourself by listening to that episode and also watching The Matrix if you've never seen The Matrix because the fight choreography in Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon is beyond anything that I've ever seen. And Wuxia is not a genre that I'm aware of, but I'm definitely going to be hunting more of these movies out because I really enjoyed this one. But as far as Hollywood goes, The Matrix has just some phenomenal fight scenes all choreographed by Yuen Wu Ping. So if you've not watched The Matrix and you like Crouching Tiger, go and watch The Matrix, man. As always, give me feedback. Let me know what you thought of my recommendations. So the next episode, we're going to be going into October and technically spooky season. And I wanted to do something a bit different. I wanted to do an October that purely consists of foreign horror. Because why not start as we mean to go on? And first up in October, for this little bit of foreign horror that I'm going to do, is one of the most financially profitable movies of all time, and also a cult phenomenon. From Japan, with a literal English title being Don't Stop the Camera, the next episode is going to be on Wall Cut of the Dead, which, if you haven't seen, it is a zombie movie unlike anything else. It's a movie I enjoyed so much, I went out and bought it on Blu-ray, Unlike Crouching Tiger, I will remedy that, I promise. But if you enjoy One Cut of the Dead, please come back for the next episode because I am going to relish looking into the making of that movie. Now, this podcast is free and it always will be free. But if you do want to support this podcast financially, you can go to verbaldiorama.com slash Patreon and you can join the amazing patrons of Verbal Diorama. Simon E, Sade, Claudia, Simon B, Laurel, Derek, Fern, Kristen, Kat, Abby, Mike, Griff, Luke, Emily, Michael, Scott, Brendan, Ian, Lisa, Sam, Will, Jack, Dave, Chris, Stuart, Sunny, Drew, Nicholas, Zoe, Kaz, Pete, Heather, Danny, and brand new patron Haley, who's just joined up. Welcome to the family, Haley. Thank you so much for becoming a patron. I really, really appreciate your support. Patrons, they have rules too. Friendship, trust, integrity, always keep your promise. I have a merch store, it's verbaldiorama.com slash merch. You can get in touch with me if you email verbaldiorama at gmail.com or you can go to my website, verbaldiorama.com and you can find links to the Twitter, the Instagram, the Facebook, the Patreon, the email, pretty much everything, really. You can also find me at filmstories.co.uk you can buy copies of the latest issue of the magazine, which I write for, and articles that I write online as well. And finally, I would rather be a ghost drifting by your side as a condemned soul than enter heaven without you. Because of your love, I will never be a lonely spirit. Bye. Hey there, classmates. Tune in to Middle Class Film Class every Monday and Wednesday for weekly movie news, streaming picks, and one deep dive review. The Batman trailer. There was a teaser. There was a trailer. Trailer one, trailer two. Final trailer? I don't know if it's the same one. How many trailers do we need exactly? Leave an email or a voicemail to join in the discussion. Bullshit artist! Uh, <laughs> yeah, buddy. All That's right. awesome. You're going full Danzig. That's right. I am. My, my trans yeah, has no power, power over me. me. <laughs> <laughs>